I'd like to start today's show with a poem written by the classic poet from South Dakota, Charles Badger Clark. This is a piece that today's guest, Wiley Gustafson, set to music for his 2001 album, Paradise. This is entitled, To Her, by Charles Badger Clark. Cut loose a hundred rivers, roaring across my trail, swift as the lightning quivers, loud as a mountain gale. I build me a boat of slivers, I weave me a sail of fur, and ducks may founder and die, but I cross that river to her. Bunch the deserts together, hang three suns in the vault, scorch the lizards to leather, strangle the springs with salt. I fly with a buzzard feather, I dig me wells with a spur, and snakes may famish and fry, but I cross that desert to her. Murder my sleep with revel, make me ride through the bogs knee to knee with the devil, just ahead of the dogs. I harrow the bad lands level, I teach the tiger to purr, for saints may wallow and lie, but I go clean hearted to her. Howdy folks, this is Andy Hedges and you're listening to Cowboy Crossroads. On each episode, I interview a different guest and ask them to share stories and discuss music, poetry, and culture from the working cowboy west and beyond. My guest today is Wiley Gustafson. Wiley Gustafson is a singer, songwriter, band leader, and yodeler. He has recorded 24 albums, and he and his band, The Wild West, have been touring the world for the past 33 years. Wiley has appeared on the Grand Ole Opry, Prairie Home Companion, and the Conan O'Brien Show. In 2019, Wiley was inducted into the Montana Cowboy Hall of Fame. I sat down with Wiley during the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering in Elko, Nevada, and recorded this interview. Here's Wiley Gustafson. So yeah, my name is Wiley Gustafson, uh, born in 1961 up in Conrad, Montana, and uh, my dad had moved to Conrad, Montana as a vet in the early 50s. He got out of vet school, went to college on the GI Bill. After World War II, he was in the Navy and um, was a Navy pilot, got out of the Navy and went to vet school, finished vet school, uh, married my mom, Patricia Galt, who was uh, a banker's daughter, a rancher's daughter, banker's daughter from uh, Great Falls, Montana, and uh, they started their life up in Conrad in the 50s, and uh, I was born in 61. I was the last of five kids that was born, uh, three other brothers and a sister. And uh, yeah, so the Gustafson family, they were Swedes that first came across, uh, I think the late 1800s, ended up in Pennsylvania, uh, then Minnesota, and then a few of them came to Montana. And that's about as far west as they got. And so I'm third generation Montanan on that side, and then fourth generation Montanan on the Galt side, which um, they they were Scottish English, moved into uh, a little community, Geyser in Stanford, Montana, uh, which is in the Judith Gap area, Montana, uh, near Lewis Lewistown in the 1800s. And... Um, they were bankers and car dealers and ranchers and uh, ended up moving to Great Falls. And my mom, that's where she was raised. So I was blessed with a wonderful set of parents that um, I, I think that is overlooked now um, how important parents are in, in raising kids. And, and um, I just felt lucky to be, have great parents that kind of encouraged me with my music. I was the youngest so by the time I rolled around and had to make my college decisions, they just said, go do what you want. So I went to two years of, 
uh, college at the University of Montana because that's where all the bands were. And that's where you could get work as a musician. There was three agents, three agencies. And this was in the days, so 70s and 80s. I got there in 1980. There was three booking agents. And if you wanted to work full time as an artist, you could you could hook up with one of the agents and go on the road full time. So went to college for a couple of years and the agents finally said, well, if you guys want to work full time, we can make that happen. And um, so we all quit college, all four of us, and went and played on the road. We were a college band and the, where the money was was in the college towns doing dances. That's how we made a really good living. Doing what kind of music were y'all playing? It was, at that uh, time? you know, probably it, it was a lot of a lot of Beatles, Rolling Stones, Chuck Berry, dance music, you know, and then a few of the pop hits. We didn't do anything really heavy. We were more on the pop side of things. Yeah, just a college dance band, and then, you know, we did some Johnny Cash. And, uh, I grew up listening to the country music, you know, Buck Owens, Merle Haggard. It's what my parents liked. My dad and we listened to the country radio stations growing up. And my dad was a folk musician. I guess you'd call him an American folk musician because he knew a lot of great old time cowboy songs. And he would gather us in the living room, usually on a weekend. Uh, He was a ranch vet, but um, loved to pick up the old Martin D18 guitar and and strum songs to us and um you know Curly Fletcher and uh, uh he had a couple Curly Fletcher songs like Old Flying You which is one of my favorite songs that he did to me that really sucked me into cowboy music cuz it told a story those songs like the Old Flying You the Bad Brahma Bull and you could it was like watching a movie all the stuff that was going on in this song. So that was probably one of my top requests. And then he also knew a lot of obscure folk songs like Johnny Verbeck, uh, old 10th Mountain Division World War II skiing songs, like uh, one of them was titled Ula. And so all these quirky songs that were definitely from the American folk genre. And so that's what I grew up listening to. And those were kind of family songs we'd all sing along. And uh, he did a few Burl Wives songs like Skip to My Lou and, um, you know, we'd all take turns dancing with my sister. So it was a great way to grow up listening to dad singing in the living room. And he was quite an influence on me. I started, I picked up the guitar. I think the first song that I learned was a song called Old Blue, you know, the old folk song. And it was two chords. And, uh, yeah, it, that was the first song I remember learning. And uh, then started listening to... Like I, I got, I, we had a great radio stations out out of Great Falls, Montana. Uh, KM, KMON is still there, and they had a show called Grassroots Gold, and it lasted about forty years. And there was a couple DJs that played. This was in the sixties and seventies when I was listening to it, but it played music from the thirties, forties, and fifties, and they played a lot of yodeling music. So I got into listening. Uh, or interested in yodeling music. And my dad was a yodeler. He would yodel up on the ski hill and out on horseback when we were riding. Whenever he was happy, he would yodel. And so I got kind of got interested in yodeling through listening to the old time uh, radio show on KMON and listening to my dad. Did you have a, a vision in those days of, you know, doing what you do now? You know, because I can see how you you pulled from all of these yeah. Influences, you know, the old country and the old uh, classic rock and, and the cowboy folk music and the yodeling and, and just your life in the West and, you know, kind of create have created your own Yeah, that sound. started, you know, my interest in music and playing in a band started. My brother was in a high school rock band, you know, dance band. They do the Sadie Hawkins dances and all the kids wanted to hear rock and roll back then to dance to, and he needed, eventually needed a bass player. So I think I was 14 years old, 15 years old. I remember I had to make the choice. One brother was more in the cowboy world, and he was a, he wanted me to go to a team roping at a small town rodeo in Montana. And I really liked roping, I had a good rope horse, but my brother was in the rock band, he needed a bass player. So I had to make the decision whether I wanted to go roping or, do a concert with my brother. And I, of course, I made the music decision because 
I just, uh, music was, I, it just excited me, you know, and I was really drawn to music and watched my brother up on stage, you know, kind of um, getting all that attention. And I was kind of shy. So I was the ba- the cheap bass player. I actually cheap. I, I would play for free just to get up on stage and play with my brother. And so we started playing Chuck Berry songs, did a lot of Chuck Berry songs, played a lot of dances in high school. And then he went to college. He was four years ahead of me. By the time he was a senior in college, I'd gone to college too, University of Montana in Missoula, and he needed a bass player. We, we actually formed a band there, and I was one of the main singers. We had another singer, and we went and did high school dances on the weekends, two nights a week usually, and we'd pull in five or $600 a night. Back in the early 80s, that was a lot of money. So I put myself through the first couple of years of college. My parents didn't have to send me any money. And, um, you know, eventually I ended up buying the PA and a truck to haul the band around. And that that band, eventually my brother left that band and went back and finished his teaching degree in college. And so we went on the road for six years. We recorded three albums, a rock and roll albums. And that band ended in 1986. And I had made some California connections. We got some, some of our songs since we recorded and they were on albums, ended up on like MTV basement tapes. We did a video of one of the songs. And then some songs ended up on a made-for-TV movie through our California. We had some California connections. I don't know how we got those, but so we started getting interest from like the California music scene. So the band ended and I moved down to California in 1986. I got down there and there was a band on every corner. And that at that point, I thought, well, this would be a good time to do what, you know, I, I I saw, started seeing bands. I would go hang out at the Palomino Club, which is in North Hollywood, and see bands like um, um, Dwight Yoakam, uh, Lucinda Williams, Dave Alvin, uh, great rockabilly scene, Russell Scott and the Red Hots, um, uh, Big Sandy and the Fly Right Boys. It was just this hodgepodge of American music coming from all kind of directions. And of course, they had the heavily influenced, a lot of Buck Owens and Merle Haggard influence still going on at the Palomino Club with the original music was there. So Dale Dale Watson was also playing in the Palomino at that time. We, on Tuesday nights, there was a show called Ronnie Max Barn Dance. And if you were playing country music, especially original country music, that's where you would end up. That was the only show in town that... that played on a continual basis where you could you talk to Ronnie and say, Ronnie, you know, uh, will you have us on? And he'd put put us on about once a month at, at the Palomino Club on Tuesday nights, Ronnie Max Barn Dance. They also had a live airing of that show on one of the college stations there. I forget the call letters. So it was kind of a big deal to to make it to that level where you were on Ronnie Max Barn Dance. I kind of meant you were somebody in the country music scene. And that's where all the guys like I just listed, you know, Dave Alvin would show up and uh, you know, the Dave and Deke combo, uh, um, those guys were great. There was just so many great artists, uh, Chris Gaffney. Anyway, we, we were seen there by Dale Watson, had a manager by the name of Mitch Cohen, and Mitch saw us there, and so we got management. And I had a, just got a, I had a day job working for a law firm where I could actually make money because playing in LA, you, it, it cost you money. You had to pay for rehearsals. You didn't make any money playing the clubs. It was just exposure, but you had to pay your band. So I needed a good day job to pay all those guys and kind of record and develop the band and uh, eventually got a manager. And then my idea was country music television had just started and they needed music videos to fill 24 hours worth of airtime on CMT. It was 24 hours. And TNN had, I think, 12 hours of video time. So we, we, I took a guerrilla film crew up to Montana, like a director, sound guy, and an assistant. Flew them up there. On a, I had a credit card, I think $7,000 limit. So I spent all the money to get these guys up there. We shot two videos up at my family ranch on the Two Medicine River. It was horseback. It was a lot of exteriors. And None, there was nothing like that on country music television at the time. And those videos did really 
well just because of the Montana landscapes. And um, was one of those cattle call. Uh, one was that was a second album. The first video that did really well was a song called This Time, and it was uh, kind of a medium tempo West Coast shuffle, Bakersfield shuffle. My brother wrote the song, and we recorded that, and, and that went in, into like medium rotation. We actually only had three songs recorded at that point that were quality, uh, airplay quality, and and we had, did the videos, and they started playing them. So we had to finish an album really quick and get a full album's worth because we were getting airplay on CMT. So within a few months, we had a full album's worth of song, shot a couple more videos, and they kept playing them on CMT. So that was a big break for us. Our timing was right because we were an independent band. We didn't have a major label behind us, but they were looking for videos, and they would play independent ba bands. So there was actually some really cool videos early on because they were, you know, some of them weren't great, but some of them were just interesting and different. You know, they weren't all corporate country, Nashville country stuff. So... Um, that helped us get a record deal eventually. We started making trips to Nashville and um, getting guest appearances on Crook and Chase and Ralph Emery Show and Nashville Tonight. There was a lot of opportunities for us to go just kind of be on these, these talk shows. We uh, CMT, we met with them a lot. They kind of liked us and they kept wanting more videos and that was kind of where my country career started and spent a lot of time got an apartment in Nashville and I probably spent half the time in Nashville at, the, at that time I still loved lived in Southern California and um, I think in 1995 my wife and I wanted to get out of California music career was kind of going in Nashville and so I said why don't we just move back up to her family farm, which was in Eastern Washington. And so we moved up there and she was with her parents, living on the farm with her parents. And that meant I could travel and didn't have to worry about her as much being alone in LA. So did that. And we were doing, doing so much touring back then. And we would take anything. We were out. Um, I remember like five years in a row, um, we were out over 200 days a year on the road, you know, just doing it the old way. Um, playing clubs and, you know, you'd have one good gig a week and then have to fill the rest of the week with, you know, two and $300 bar gigs or whatever. But it was, it was cutting our teeth and just, you know, learning how to be a dance band. A lot of stuff we did was dance oriented. So you'd have to go into the bars and they wanted a dance band. So we, you know, we did a lot of West Coast shuffle, Western swing. And, and um, along with our Original music, we could put in about half the songs, of original songs, and just kind of plugged away. And eventually, through our Nashville connections, I got a new manager in Nashville by the name of David Skepner. And David Skepner managed Loretta Lynn for most of her career. And at the time, David Skepner was managing Writers in the Sky. So that was a good connection for me because Writers in the Sky were on Rounder Records and doing really well for them. And they were getting all that Toy Story stuff going on, so they were kind of a big deal. And good friends of mine, I'd met them in California when they'd come through and do the Gene Autry Museum and stuff, and Doug was a yodeler, and we were we had a conversation going, and we'd share music and old yodeling tapes. So got signed with David Skepner, and then through that got a record deal with Rounder and we did three or four albums I think four albums with Rounder maybe five and uh, that was in the early 90s yeah mid 90s even though Wiley's music sometimes has a traditional country sound he's noted for playing cowboy music not country he once said this the country music industry has become silly. It does not reflect the country lifestyle in my mind. I made it a goal to promote the cowboy lifestyle and celebrate our culture in a way that is real. So yeah, I grew up in the thick of it. My dad was a AQHA judge and had nice quarter horses, cow horses, ranch horses. So we grew up around that. And I kind of 
You know, I think sometimes when you grow up around that stuff, you don't cherish it maybe as much as you should, or it just seems normal and you, you want to see if there's anything else out in the world. And and so the Nashville scene and the opportunities with the CMT and Nashville Network, uh, you know, they wanted a certain sound, you know, and we were friends with a group called the Mavericks Um they would come out and watch us all the time. And, and so there was this whole scene going on there where it wasn't typical Nashville music, but it was, it was a more traditional uh, dance-oriented stuff, I guess. And, and so that's kind of the direction I headed to try to get a major deal in Nashville. All, of course, all the major labels turned us down and Rounder picked us up. And then I remember about that time, Rounder was – a free enough, they didn't, never told you what to play. And looking at the rounder artist list at that time, they had everything. They had Writers in the Sky, which, you know, Hollywood Western music. They had uh, Skip Gorman, which great, you know, orig- authentic cowboy uh, music. They had bluegrass music. They had just all sorts of folk music. I think they had 500 artists, so they didn't care what you did. And about that time, I took a trip to um, Elko in 1995 to check out the National Cowboy Gathering. I had no idea that there was an audience that would listen to cowboy music. And once I saw that, once I saw what was going on here in Elko, it really made me think of, of, okay, I fell in love with Elko and the artists and the music I heard. I mean, it was just like getting a shot of adrenaline because I had grown up with this music from dad playing it, the old cowboy stuff. And I I suddenly realized that there was guys that were having careers doing cowboy music, Ian Tyson. And, um, you know, these, there was artists that were seemed to do really well with cowboy music. And there was an audience that was buying it. And so at that time I, I said, well, I'm going to start doing what I grew up with. It felt good and kind of got away from even trying to impress Nashville at all. Cause all the major labels had turned us down rounder said, go ahead and do what you want to do. So we started doing, you know, cowboy music, uh, what I considered Western. Some of it was contemporary, contemporary Western Ian Tyson kind of, Uh, I was a huge fan of Ian. He was one of the best melody writers, lyric writers. I mean, he had the whole package um, of and chord changes and and then really speaking to an audience of ranchers that liked him. You know, he was he could speak to the ranching families and the people who did it for a living and they they got it. You know, Um, they they didn't look at Ian as some guy that you know, didn't know what he was talking about. His music was authentic with the cowboy community. And I, that impressed me, you know, and then met Tom Russell and Tom was doing some great cowboy songwriting. Uh, Again, I think Tom Russell is one of the great American songwriters in a sense that he was, he was studying it and it obviously had gone back and listened to a lot of the old stuff, but he was a balladeer, could tell stories and, you know, um, Gallo del Cielo, songs like that, that just uh, were so authentic and so cool. And so actually I started thinking, you know, cowboy music is way more cool than, you know, anything in Nashville could produce and Nashville could do. So I kind of slowly left the idea of Nashville, but we do enough dances and stuff to where we still have the dance music and um, still recorded it. Every album that we do would have the cowboy element, but it would have a dance element too, because we, we got hired for a lot of cowboy dances. Elko hires us every time they hire us, we seem to do the cowboy dance. So still a heavy dance element to it. But yeah, I, I really got interested in the songwriting side of cowboy music through listening to Tom Russell and, and Ian Tyson. And then the poets started listening to um, the great poets, Joel Nelson and Randy Ryman and, um, and those guys, um, Glenn Orlin, you know, and, and realizing that uh, there was some great poems out there. And so when I 
listened to Randy do Hooves of the Horses. I kind of researched it and nobody, I couldn't find anybody that ever written music for Hooves of the Horses. So that's, I think, one of the first uh, classic cowboy poems I put music to. And then like uh, Joel, I heard him recite uh, Equus Cabayas. Uh, that just sucked me in and that was such a great poem. And I approached him and said, you know, can I take a run at that? Can I try putting music to it? And he said, yeah, go ahead. And so I put some music behind Equus Cabayas. Um, I'm a huge Badger Clark fan, did did a song called, the poem called To Her, put some music behind that. So just found that some of these old classic poems, there was a place to try to put some music behind it. And that's a huge step, you know, because these classic poems have been around forever, 100, 100 years almost now. And so whenever you try to, it, it's a huge mountain to climb to try to put the music that will equal anything or get close to the quality of the poem, you know. But I think um, a lot of people like what we did with To Her and what we did with Echo Scabias and um, Pose of the Horses, you know, so, yeah. Wiley's official bio says this. That hard-worn belt buckle he wears wasn't won on eBay. As an accomplished horseman, he has claimed several hard-won regional and national titles within the National Cutting Horse Association. I asked Wiley to talk about his interest in riding cutting horses. My, my first wife, Kimberly, uh, we moved back to Washington. Her family was into cutting horses big time. They were into the West Coast breeds, uh, King Fritz and Doc Tom Tucker and Dry Dock. And her, my wife's aunt was into cutting, did AQHA cutting shows and NCHA cutting shows. And then my wife got interested in cutting, bought a cutting horse. Uh, about that time, the Yahoo deal came through. And we had money to buy cutting horses. Actually, she started cutting before the money came in, so we were cutting on a budget, which is hard to do in the NCHA because the entry fees are so big and then gas money and all that. But in a couple of years, we had actually some money to throw around, spend on good cutting horses, got her a good cutting horse, and I was the chauffeur. I was into team roping and had a good, really good roping horse. And then I went to the John Scott sale in Billings, near Billings, Montana, and, and he had a horse called Patty's Irish Whiskey, and I bought, he had some sales, and he was kind of selling out of a lot of his horses, um, and I bought a big, old Patty's Irish Whiskey bred horse, a uh, young one, he was a yearling, but he was big. Nobody else, none of the cutters wanted him because he was too big, and I thought, well, he'd make a good roping horse, so I brought him home, and my wife said, well, why don't we let him try to be a cutting horse? So we sent him up to a trainer up in Canada. Billy Spate had him as a three-year-old. And uh, he he was way more than, than uh, in terms of talent than anything we could have expected or hoped for. He was just a freak. He was so talented and um, won a little bit of money, I think, on his three-year-old year. But then we took him down to back home and I started riding him and and instead of being a chauffeur, now I had my own cutting horse. And then we uh, showed him in his four-year-old year. I had a trainer show him, and then I started showing him in uh, some of the, like, the 2,000 limit rider classes I was just starting. And he was such a good horse that within a few years, we were we had worked our way up into the non-pro class. And uh, we're winning a lot of the aged events up in that area and doing weekend shows. And um, I just had a great horse, had Nothing to do much with me, but when you get uh, blessed with a, a great horse, God blessed me with just a wonderful horse in the cutting pan. And, and so I was doing well, had a great horse, and had enough money through the Yahoo deal to go pay the $500 entry fees for some of these big weekend shows. And uh, he mounted. I could go into the herd being confident enough to know I had such a good horse that if the cattle were right and everything turned out right, we had a pretty good chance of winning. And um we went through a whole bunch of seasons up in the Northwest and went into Canada and did the aged events and um, had a lot of fun for about, I don't know, seven or eight years riding old whiskey, um, doing the cutting horse thing. So I um, have a whole shelf of belt buckles. And like I say, it was um, 
you know, take a green guy like me who had never done a lot of cutting, um, but had ridden a lot of horses, but he made a cutter out of me, you know, yeah. In his wonderful book, Saddle Songs, A Cowboy Song Bag, the great Don Edwards said this about cowboy yodeling. Yodeling seems to be synonymous with Western music and cowboy singing, although most old-time cowboys considered it to be just howling and humming. The field haulers of southern black field workers and the cowboys' Texas lullaby were both eerie and haunting falsetto calls. The haulers were definitely of African origin and could have possibly influenced the cowboy's strange and wordless lullaby. In any case, both the field hauler and the Texas lullaby would later become incorporated into blues songs and cowboy ballads. Wiley is considered one of the finest yodelers of our time, and I asked him to talk about how yodeling has found its place in his music. So when I, back to the Palomino days, there was a band on every corner and you'd go play the clubs and nobody would listen at all. You know, everybody heard everything before. And so I thought, you know, I, I yodeled in high school, just as kind of goofing off thing. And my dad yodeled and I, I learned a yodeling song. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. She slid down the mountain on her little old lady who, uh, I think it was, uh, New Riders of the Purple Sage or one of those California bands did it. It's a novelty song. And I learned it. And so I knew how to yodel a little bit. And then uh, when I was in California trying to get attention in the bars, I thought, well, I'm going to try some yodeling. And as soon as I started yodeling, people set their beers down and listened. And it was like, it was a novelty thing, but they, you could get them to listen for a song at least. I thought that was kind of cool. And so... Then I thought, well, you know, yodeling, I started going to the old record, vinyl record shops in L.A. The big record shops down in Hollywood area that were like warehouses full of old albums. So I went and talked to one of the guys there and he said, where's your yodeling section? Or I'm interested in yodeling. Give me some names. You know, so and he was the perfect guy to ask. So he took me to the section. We picked out a bunch of yodeling albums, Elton Britt, um, Kenny Roberts, uh, then um, Jimmy Rogers. I just found as much yodeling stuff as I could and uh, started listening to that. At the same time, I asked my dad, I said, Dad, where'd you learn how to yodel? And he said, well, my sister had a Austrian yodeling instructional reel-to-reel tape, and he had listened to that, and he would learned to listen. And I said, well, does she still have the copy? So I talked to my cousin. He said, yeah, we'll send that to you. So I had a Austrian yodeling instructional tape. Franzel Long was the yodeler, and he's, he's like the Elvis of yodelers in the Alpine area of Europe. And uh, I could slow it down to half speed, and he was a fancy yodeler. I mean, really quick Austrian-Swiss-type yodeling. And so I could slow it down to half speed and kind of, learn the intervals and, and uh, the tongue tricks and all that. And so I really started getting into it, like, what is yodeling all about and how do you break it down technically? And um, and I was able to do that because I could play at half speed. And so I started yodeling a few songs, the fancy cowboy yodeling. And so the, the cowboys picked up the yodeling from the Austrian style, the fancy fast style, um, for the most part. It came from the Europe and the cowboy bands got a hold of it. I, somebody told me a story that it was a uh, Oklahoma swing band. Adolf Hoffner or one of those guys had a Swiss guy in the band. And somebody told me the fiddle player got sick one night. So instead of doing fiddle solos, they would do yodel, yodeling solos. And it worked. Uh, yodeling worked with Western swing music. That was the story I heard. I don't know how much truth there is to that. Um, but... Pretty soon, yodeling became kind of a signature of a lot of the cowboy singers. You know, Elton Britt really took it and ran with it. Kenny Roberts, uh, Montana Slim, which is um, I can't, from Canada. Wilf Carter. Wilf Carter, thank you. Yeah. 
Montana Slim was his American name, but Wolf Carter, great yodeler, he took it and ran with it. And so I was listening to these guys and incorporating that into my songwriting. And then we had a few cover songs we did from those guys in our set too. And I tried to use it in a set to kind of not beat people over the head with it. And that's the trick with yodeling because you can overdo it. Um, there's a subtlety to it. And not only that, I started wanting to learn the different styles of yodeling. I started listening to a lot of Emmett Miller from the vaudeville eras, 20s and 30s. And that came from the African-American style of yodeling, uh, Jimmy Rogers. And it was, it was a little bit different. But Emmett Miller wrote Lovesick Blues, and he would incorporate voice breaks into the melody. And it wasn't the typical one, four, five triad type yodel. He would just um, break a note and go up into a third or fifth or whatever, or octave. And so I've, I found that, well, that's a kind of a different style of yodeling. So the first yodeling album I did was for Rounder Records, and it was called Total Yodel. And it was all yodeling, but I didn't want it to be an album of just beat you over the head, fast, fancy cowboy yodeling. So I started researching the African. African American influence, and uh, there was also a style of yodeling, you know, cattle call and cowpoke, where that was a slow yodel, and it wasn't necessarily a triad yodel. It was just breaking, voice breaking notes and adding to the melody, and so that would, that's kind of a my dad did a lot of that, and he called it high plains yodeling, um, and it kind of evoked the wide open spaces, and it was usually a slow waltz type of yodel. And so put a few of those on the album, put a few fancy, fast cowboy yodeling songs, did a few couple Jimmy Rogers songs, uh, Hank Williams, Emmett Miller, you know, Lovesick Blues. And so I tried to make it an album that had at least four styles of yodeling on it, and that did really well with Rounder. And also kind of put us on the map of, okay, Wiley, is a yodeler, and that about that time, Yahoo found me through yodeling at, at the Palomino Club, and I think one of the uh, guys who did advertising soundtracks was down at the Palomino and heard me and said, will you come in and do a, a yodeling for some of our advertisements, which at the time in the 90s, the national ad campaigns were using yodeling and surf guitar. Those were things to kind of get tickle people's ears, I guess, to listen to these ads as um, soundtracks to these advertisements. And so I did Mitsubishi, Miller Lite, um, Taco Bell. I did a whole string of national commercials that used yodeling. And they were like, for me, a starving musician in L.A., big money. I mean, uh, you could get the royalties, I call it mailbox money, because all of a sudden these big checks, you know, 10 grand would show up from doing a Taco Bell commercial in your mailbox. And it helped me fund the band and and kind of put money into recording and equipment and all that. So the yodeling thing kind of took off. And then in 1996, internet was kind of taken off. Yahoo was taken off and they wanted to incorporate a yodel into the Yahoo name. So they called me and said, come down. I, I'd moved to Washington at that time, flew down uh, and was in the studio for 15 minutes. I said, you know, what do you think you want? And they kind of explained to me where they were headed. So I came up with all these different yodels incorporating the Yahoo name. And, um, you know, five or 10 minutes, I had a whole bunch of different styles of yodel. And they picked one, put it on a regional ad. So I got paid a union scale, which is, I think, 500 bucks for a regional ad back then. Totally different than a national ad. Because then you start getting royalties uh, on a larger scale. And for the first, 1996, Yahoo went public. They did their regional commercial. And then I was watching the Super Bowl in either 1998 or 99. And Yahoo had a big ad on the Super Bowl. And at the end of the ad, they used the Yahoo yodel that I did for a regional commercial. And I said, that's cool, but wait a minute. It shouldn't be a national commercial like this. Nobody talked to me. So somebody ripped the yodel off the regional commercial and put it on. Um, So I called Yahoo and said, hey, we need to get this straightened out because um, you're using the yodel that I created. And and, uh, they ignored me 
for a while. And finally, I had to hire an attorney to get them serious and, and uh, wrote a bunch of letters. And finally, they got serious and, and uh, ended up buying the copyright of the Yodel from me. And, and that, that was about the time we were buying cutting horses and stuff like that and built a nice indoor arena for cutting horses and um, had a little money to play around. And it also let me get off the road. I was, you know, 200 days on, a, a year on the road before that. And then started focusing on cutting on the weekends, you know, and saying no to a lot of the music jobs and just doing, having a lot of fun hitting the cutting road with my wife. I was no longer the chauffeur, you know. I was still the chauffeur, but also get on, had my own cutting horse. So that's kind of where um, that went. And then, yeah, the yodeling, um, it it's always been a part of my show. And uh, again, I think you have to use it. You can't overuse it, but it's an American art form and an art form that I think needs to stick around because it's a high vocal art form and there's a serious side to it technically. I'm a, as I grew, I wanted to be a te- technically proficient yodeler, but also have the soul of the yodeling too, like the African-American yodeling, like cowpoke and stuff like that. It has a lot of soul in it and it comes at you from a different direction. So um, I still use it in the shows and it's still a big part of our shows. And some people love it. Some people get annoyed by it, but yeah. Cowboy Crossroads archives on episode 12, there's a great segment where my guest Paul Zarziski talks about co-writing songs with Ian Tyson and Wiley Gustafson. Wiley and Paul have written a number of songs together, many of which appeared on Wiley's rockin' rodeo album, Hang and Rattle. I asked Wiley to discuss the process of writing songs with Paul Zarziski. Yeah, so I met Paul at the at Elko here, and um, fellow Montana, and he didn't live that far away from me. Uh, he originally lived up in Augusta when I first met, met him, which is thirty or forty minutes away from Conrad, up in northern Montana. Then he moved closer to Great Falls, so he's still within an hour of me. But um, I really appreciated Paul's attention to words. You know, words really important to him. He was more than a, he, he wasn't a reciter, really. Um, he, he was a creator that wrote, used these beautiful words to describe our West. And the other thing I liked about Paul, he didn't do straight cowboy poetry. He would take you different directions and kind of, kind of pull you in these places that you normally wouldn't go at a cowboy poetry gathering. And he had humor he had these serious poems. He had poems that rhymed, poems that didn't rhyme. Um, and he was just such a master and a mentor for how important words are. And, and that's really what he taught me. And then I knew he was working with Tom doing songs and um, Tom Russell. And he was doing a few c- collaborations with musicians and I thought, I asked him, I said, well, why don't, why don't we together, get together and try something, you know? And we worked together. It was so fun working with Paul. We really had fun writing. And it was, mo- I lived in Washington at the time. And uh, we would fax. I had, you know, that was in the days of faxes. And he would fax me and then something. And I'd send him my, what I thought it was. And he'd cross out a lot of words because words were important. And um, he really taught me um, how to be a better songwriter through, you know, every word was important. And uh, I think we had some great collaborations uh, on our CD, Hang and Rattle. Um, Paul did half the songs. We co-wrote half the songs on that. And there's some great stuff. I think it was a little bit ahead of its time. And then musically, um, what I learned about Paul is he he likes rock and roll. He loves rock and roll. And he always thought cowboy music needed to be have more life and soul and, and uh, fun in it. And so um, he pushed me to kind of um, 
go back to my rock and roll upbringing. And uh, it was fun for me. We, we, some of the songs, like the, especially the rodeo songs, I remember my, my uh, Keith Richards licks from playing all those Rolling Stones songs. So we did, had, had a, some of the songs had that treatment on it. And I think it was a little bit ahead of its time. You know, Mike Beck was using a little bit of rock and roll. And, and, um, but I think uh, some of it was going, kind of went over some people's heads. But I think, still think 40 years from now, if you go back and listen to that album, um, it will never get old. I think it was one of my best um, songwriting albums for sure. And uh, sonically, kind of we veered off in a different direction with it, but um, I'm still, re- still really proud of it. And uh, we don't do a lot of songs off of that album anymore. Uh, but, you know, it's just one of those times and places where did some great stuff with writing with Paul. And more than anything, whenever I wrote a song after writing with Paul, boy, Words mattered, you know. He really taught me to be a better songwriter. And he was like the professor, like I was just a, a student in his class of how important words were. And, and um, man, we, we would argue over one single word or one single image, you know, and it was really good for me. And he always, you know, 90% of the time he won. Um, and um, that was really important. And it, it just, I needed that at that time for my songwriting to to be with somebody who said, you know, don't, don't just throw words out there because they rhyme or be lazy. And, and to me, I agree, the songwriting, um, too, many, too many songwriters don't spend enough time on the lyrics and just kind of throw something out there that's trite or, you know, um, I, I don't like songs that are just doing the same old thing and, cliches and you know cowboy music you have a tendency sometimes to go down that road of campfires and coyotes and you know starry nights and all that stuff and I've I've written my share of those songs but um, there's a whole world outside of that that um, Paul taught me um, especially with the landscape songs like Grace as I'm really proud of that co-write that's a song off the album Hang and Rattle that we still do um, that uh, the words are just beautiful. He wrote most of the words on it. I think I did a lot of work on the chorus or the refrain, but um, that song is still a big part of our set list. And um, one of the most beautiful songs written about the American, the Western landscape. I recorded this interview with Wiley during the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering, where we were both performing. Asked Wiley to talk about what had gripped him about cowboy poetry and the arts that come from the cowboy culture. Because I know the first time I came here in 95, I was so blown away by this art form. And it's, it's, um, there's so much quality in this art form through the poetry and through the music. It's undeniable. And our American musical culture and poetic culture is always going to need cowboy poetry because it is, there's something so honest about it, so working man, so down to earth that it will never get old. It will have its cycles of going up and down. I think we're on an up cycle right now with the crowds that are coming back here. But I really take take it seriously as an art form because I was so blown away by it by the first time. You know, when people think of cowboy poetry, you really, if you've never been to Elko and seen the quality of it, you just think, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if I'm going to like it or not, but I'll, I, I came to check it out because I was into the cowboy culture. And then when I dove into it and heard all the great, great artists it was like it just lit me on fire so i know there's that about it that will never go away and i know that it's real i know that there's something in our art form that you can't get anywhere else you know it's like the old sea ballads and things like that there's an honesty a working man's aspect to it that goes pretty deep and i think in cowboy with the horse element and the landscape element that we have so much to play with and so many places to take people and so many connections that is lacking in America, this country that 
um, used to be 90% agrarian and 10% people lived in the city. It's flip-flopped. And now 10% of the people or less live out in the country and 90% of them live in the city. They need their connection back to Mother Earth. And I think cowboy music offers that like no other art form. It brings people to a place that they forgot about maybe a couple generations now. And people, when you talk to them, it usually brings them back to their grandparents or how they used to go visit on their family ranch or family farm. And um, in American songwriting, in uh, all the way from the middle 1800s to, you know, the 1940s, 50s, 60s, there is so much there. And so much of it, uh, to me, when I listen to American folk music, um, there's a quality from those old times that people realize that's kind of been lost, I think, um, especially in the lyrical side of things. You read the Civil War letters from just normal soldiers and the poetic, the poetic beauty of those simple letters written by some soldier, you know, um, it, it just, that's been lost. But I think some of the music from that era has captured all that poeticness and the beauty of words. And I think especially the cowboy poets knew about all that. When my dad was going to school, he, he was born in 1925. So in the 30s, every kid in school um, had to learn poems. I mean, that it was just part of growing up, you know. Everybody knew a, at least a couple Robert Service poems. And I think people are missing that too, right? Um, uh, we've, we've lost that a little bit. And that's where cowboy music kind of takes us back to those days. And people, like I say, they've missed it for a couple generations now. And they haven't even known they've, how much they've missed it. But that's what cowboy music brings to audiences. And that's why we get people from, from New York and California coming to these and they're blown away and they keep coming back year after year after the first time they've been here. So, and then the ambassador side of it, I, I take that really seriously too. We have traveled to China and South America and Japan and Australia and um, Moscow, uh, a Russia tour with Paul and Paul and me uh, went on a Russia tour and did six Russian cities. It's all because of the cowboy element. And so I take that side of it really seriously. Seriously, because it breaks down borders, and um, that is such a music is such a great way to find common good in man, you know, especially between like Russia and America. It was great doing that Russia tour. Um, it was still a communist country, but a lot of the people came out and saw us and see this side of America that they'd never seen before. And even though they may not have gotten every word of Paul's or every word of mine, they're they loved it, you know, just because it was honest American stuff. And I can't tell you, can't tell you exactly why they loved it, but they got really excited about it. And whenever we tour over in Europe or Japan or China, there's a connection there. And it, people get really excited about something American, especially authentic American, you know. So we, we've been lucky to be on uh, a few tours, cultural diplomacy tours, they call it. And... Uh, and that's just been a cool part of my career, being able to do that and go to those places. I told you about my good cutting horse, Whiskey, and he passed away this year. He was 25 years old, so he had a good long life. But, um, you know, whenever I wrote a horse song, uh, center, it, center it around Whiskey. And uh, we got a, a Wrangler Award for this song, original song, I think. So uh, it's called Where Horses Are Heroes. Send me away To the heart of the battle Where truth can be found In the perch of a saddle Where fate unfolds On oceans of green Where horses are heroes And cowboys are kings Take me away 
take me away Way up on high Up on a cow camp Cutting out drives Where a good cow pony Would make a fool of machines Where horses are heroes And cowboys are kings Where a man is content to be alone With a house of sky to call his own Where the jack pine whispers and the red tail screams Where horses are heroes and cowboys are kings Ah, oh, sing me away To the roll and the rattle Of a thousand head Of wandering cattle Let the ancient song Of the prairie ring Where horses are heroes and cowboys are kings where horses are heroes and cowboys are kings Folks, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank Wiley Gustafson for taking the time to visit with me. You can find out more about Wiley at wileywebsite.com. I'd like to thank Hal Cannon for playing the Cowboy Crossroads theme music. You can find out more about Hal at halcannon.com. I'd like to thank my Trail Boss patrons, Bob Kelly, Chris Ryden, and Scott Anderson for their support of this episode. If you're enjoying Cowboy Crossroads and would like to help me keep it going, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash cowboycrossroads. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash cowboycrossroads. You can also make a donation on my website at andyhedges.com. If you'd like to contact me with a question or a comment or a story, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email to andy at andyhedges.com. Thank you for listening to Cowboy Crossroads.